Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jason Kuo. I'm from Eventbrite, and I'm very pleased that JNUC is using Eventbrite to power all the ticketing and all that kind of stuff. And Eventbrite, our, our goal is to bring people together through the power of live experiences. And this has just a, been a great experience for me to actually meet people like you in the audience and people like you, like all the presenters and everything, and just chat about uh, all the different things you guys are facing. And it's so cool to be able to do that live, which is just a neat thing. So my, my talk today is called Starfish IT. And I'm going get, to get to that in a little bit. And we're, I'm going to talk about uh, what we did at Eventbrite to be able to, to scale up our Mac management and authentication infrastructure. And that's a picture of me. But I'm right here, so I'm going to move on. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, first thing we're going to talk about is, what do Starfish have to do uh, with IT? What does a Starfish IT organization look like? And how can you get there? And then at the very end, I'll have some time about questions. So just a little bit about myself. I'm going to put a little picture up here. Uh, this, is, this is me. Uh, I know it kind of looks exactly like I look like right now, but uh, this is actually me in 2003. So I'm, I'm manage, I've been managing Macs since 2003. And if you look on this slide, you'll see some uh, iBook G3s. And I, I worked at a, an amazing high school in East Palo Alto where I was setting up these 40 iBooks uh, to put in these laptop carts right before school was about to start. And uh, if you'll notice, one of them has a target disk mode uh, picture on the top. You guys recognize that? And then uh, what I'm doing here, I'm doing uh, monolithic imaging from one computer to the other uh, using FireWire 400 on spinning drives. And uh, if you'll notice, I actually have, do we see it? There are, I think there are eight computers up there. So I'm actually, I exponentially scaled it by using four FireWire cables instead of one. <laughs> so it took me about 45 minutes per computer to set it up, but I could do four at a time. So that mean, meant I could do four in an hour. And it was just me by myself in this, in this garage setting it up. So it took me about a week to do it. But that's just kind of a little, little tidbit about me. Those, uh, those Macs, I think they had 128 megabytes of RAM. They were pretty awesome. And a CD-ROM that popped out. So th this is me uh, 10 years later. Uh, I know I look about the same and have the same haircut and everything like that. But that's me in, in uh, 2014. And this is at our Eventbrite office in San Francisco, our old one. We're now at a new one. And we're getting ready for an office expansion that basically forced our hand in terms of thinking about how in the world are we going to keep track of our Macs and support our users, because we're opening up a Nashville office with a whole bunch of customer support agents. And we didn't have any IT staff there. So we, we said, hey, how, how are we going to do this? On there, you can see a couple members, uh, some of my teammates uh, at Eventbrite. There's, we use Bright Lingo for a bunch of different things. So our IT team is called Bright Tech. So that's Aaron and Frank. They're part of the Bright Tech team. And here we are setting up and imaging a bunch of computers, this time using, using Casper and not a whole bunch of FireWire 400 cables. So I'm going to start off by, by talking about a book. So there's a book called The Starfish and the Spider. It's by someone named Ori Brofman and Rod Beckstrom. And it's a really fascinating book. Has anybody in here read this book before? Anybody? OK, so it, it's, it's awesome. You can check it out for free from the library. Um, I have it checked out on, on uh, an iOS device using the free ebook checkout stuff. So you should totally check it out. So Starfish and the Spider, what they do in this book is they trace the trajectory of a whole bunch of different organizations. And they compare uh, why certain organizations were so powerful and so unstoppable and why certain organizations weren't. So some of the ones they, they looked at were things like Wikipedia and Craigslist and Napster and Skype and all these different examples of decentralized organizations that were able to basically spread out really rapidly with very little uh, over, overhead, with very little oversight, um, not, that, not that much centralization. And they were just decentralized organizations that just worked. And they couldn't, uh, they, they tried to understand, well, what, what made them so powerful? And one of the analogies that they looked at was the analogy of a starfish. So starfish are these really fascinating organisms. And I'm going to put up a, a quote up here and, and read it to you guys. So with a spider, uh, what you see is pretty much what you get. A body's a body, a head's a head, and a leg's a leg. 
But starfish are very different. The starfish doesn't have a head. Its central body isn't even in charge. In fact, the major organs are replicated throughout each and every arm. If you cut the starfish in half, you'll be in for a surprise. The animal won't die, and pretty soon you'll have two starfish to deal with. Starfish have an incredible quality to them. If you cut an arm off, most of these animals grow a new arm. And with some varieties, such as the linkia, or long-armed starfish, the animal can replicate itself from just a single piece of arm. So this is, this is a this pretty, pretty crazy thing. So uh, a starfish doesn't have a brain. It's just a giant collection of neurons. And when it wants to move from one part of the ocean floor to the other, all the neurons just kind of talk to each other and they make a decision together. You know, hey, starfish arm, move over here. You know, starfish arm number two, like, move over here. And it just kind of glides, glides its way over. And if you cut, cut an arm off, boom, you know, it can regrow a new arm. So this kind of got me thinking about, uh, hey, what, what would this look like in an IT situation? So they studied another um, uh, lesson from history, which was uh, the conquistadors who came from Spain and started uh, conquering all the uh, civilizations in the Americas. Uh, the Aztecs and the Incas, all these uh, great civilizations, they fell really rapidly. And one of the reasons that they fell really rapidly is because they were centralized organizations. So the Aztecs, uh, with, with Montezuma in present-day Mexico, uh, when, the, when Cortez came in, he, he laid siege to the capital city, and they laid siege to the capital city for, for a year or two years or something like that. And then within that time, uh, they took out the, the ruler Montezuma, and the whole civilization collapsed in less than two years. But they ran into a problem when they went to present-day New Mexico. They ran into the Apache. So the Apache in New Mexico, they were uh, a decentralized organization. They did have a famous leader named Geronimo, but even amongst all the different tribes, they all were uh, pretty self-autonomous, and they could make their own decisions. And if you took down one leader, another one would spring up in its place. If you took down uh, one tribe or one segment of the Apache, another, another section would rise up in its place. And they tried for years. I think uh, when I was reading in the book, it was hundreds of years, and they couldn't take out the Apache. They just, they just couldn't. And, they, um, and here's a description of the difference between a spider organization on the left, which is a spider, you guys are all, all familiar with it, if you squish the, the center of the body, the, the spider is toast, whereas a starfish, you cut off an arm or part of the body, it, it keeps growing. And um, so on the left, those are examples of what a spider organization looks like, and on the right, that's what a decentralized starfish organization looks like. So just, you know, take a look at that. It's kind of interesting, if you, if you look at that list, and you think of what your IT infrastructure looks like, or even what your IT organization looks like, and say, hey, you know, wh what, would, what would it look like if our starfish, uh, if a starfish, if our IT organization was more like a starfish? The one that um, I, I was chuckling, I can't quite put my head around for an IT organization, is units are self-funding. I can't figure out how, how we would be able to do that. I think we need uh, some budget approval for some of our stuff. But a lot of this is really interesting, and I'm going to point out three. Uh, number one, for a starfish organization, if you thump it on the head, it survives. Number two, if you take out a unit, the organization is unharmed. And number three, the organization is flexible. Now look at the counterparts to this on the other side. If you take out a unit, the organization is harmed. If you thump on the head, it dies, and the organization is rigid. So I started asking this question, what, what, would this, what does this have to do with managing Mac? So I know I've been talking about Starfish for about, about four or five minutes, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to it. So here's, here's San Francisco, and here's our Eventbrite office. And in 2013, we had about 220 users and two offices and four full-time Bright Tech members. And fast forward to 2015, we have about 550 users and eight global offices and six full-time Bright Tech members. So, this became immediately something that we started thinking about when we were moving up to eight offices instead of two. We were opening the Nashville office. We were adding a, a couple, couple staff members and figuring out how are we going to keep track and keep all this stuff managed. So we had a couple options. Here's, uh, here's our eight offices in, in the world. Uh, if we went with a spider organization where everyone needed to talk to San Francisco to keep your 
users authenticated to keep your Macs in check and managed, um, we could do it like this. We could say, hey, this is, a, this is a spider organization. Everything's got a home run back to San Francisco, and we'll keep track of everything that way. But I was talking with my manager about this, and I said, hey, you know, I've been looking at this book called Starfish and the Spider, and what if we sort of imagined our global deployment of IT and Mac management and authentication more like a starfish? It would look a little bit something like this. <laughs> so I have to confess, I actually watched SpongeBob um, before I had kids. And I, I have kids now, but now I don't watch SpongeBob. But anyways, I'm just pointing that out. Um, so what if, we, what if we looked like this? Um, so Patrick Starr is a very friendly, friendly looking guy. And to be honest, uh, spiders totally freak me out. Like, I get, I get really scared. So when we have a spider inside our house, um, my kids will come up and they'll say, Daddy, Daddy, we have a spider. Can you get rid of it? And I, I run the opposite way. And I say, go find Mommy. She can take care of it. And uh, my wife will go and you know, scoop up the spider and gently you know, lift it outside. But when I look at a starfish, and if you go to a museum, you see a starfish, I'm not scared of starfish. They just kind of like lump around and they move around. So what if your IT organization, what if Eventbrite's IT looked a little bit more like a starfish? So what I'm going to do is talk about three principles that I kind of identified kind of from the book and then kind of from what we put into practice at Eventbrite. And these three principles are what what has helped us and what has made our Starfish IT organization work. So Starfish principle number one is to decentralize. If you thump it on the head, it survives. So what, what do I mean by this? So what I started asking when we were looking at our, our infrastructure was, what if we decentralize our IT infrastructure to look more like a Starfish? What it would allow us to, to be is less dependent on geography, less dependent on the San Francisco uh, HQ to keep running, and it would allow us to scale and expand um, much simpler and much more quickly. So for us, uh, you know, Eventbrite is a cloud service, and then our IT team internally also relies very much on cloud services, just like many of you guys. So I started asking this question. Instead of hosting all our stuff in-house to keep track of all our servers and all that kind of stuff, why don't we just entrust these kind of things, the maintenance, the backups, the database, um, keeping the JSS up and running, all that kind of stuff. Why don't we entrust all that to the people who do this day in and day out? And for us, that looks like entrusting our JSS to Jamf, um, AWS for a lot of our cloud-hosted servers, and Okta for our authentication. So Jamf Cloud in particular has been an awesome thing for us. And uh, so our JSS is hosted by, by Jamf. Uh, it's sitting in Amazon, and when I need an, an upgrade or, a, or retrieve something from the database or do a, do a flush of anything, I reach out to the support team, and they help me out. They've been awesome in supporting us. So I, no I noticed that um, in the security talk yesterday and um, in a couple other sessions, there's been a question about, like, what about JSS security when you're looking at uh, hosting your, J your JSS to be publicly accessible to the internet. If you're anything like us, we were pretty nervous about the idea of our JSS sitting out there on the public internet with somebody being able to, just being a username and password away from getting in to be able to execute any scripts, any packages, or anything like that. And so uh, what, we got to, what we did, uh, we worked with uh, Jamf Cloud Services, and they worked with us to create special IP filters to restrict traffic to certain portions of the JSS. So the administrative portions of the JSS can only be accessed from any of our offices, but nowhere else. Uh, whereas uh, some of the more normal, benign parts like enrollment or policy check-ins or all those kind of things um, are accessible to the public internet, and they can keep running. And I, I keep hoping that one day, and I know they mentioned it, uh, 2FA or SAML one day will kind of help mitigate this a lot more. But for now, uh, this has been, been a great solution for us. So in doing this, we kind of get the best of both worlds. We get the security of kind of having the JSS in-house, but it's really not dependent on us being able to keep our San Francisco server room up and running with our JSS, poking a hole in the firewall, allowing certain traffic to come in, certain things to go out. We just say, hey, you know, it's out. It's hosted by Jamf Cloud. They'll take care of it. 
and um, we don't have to maintain that server. We don't have to do uh, SQL cleaning, fix Tomcat, anything like that. They just take care of it for us. And at the same time, we maintain control of the Casper shares and packages and all the deployment points. So the other piece to this equation is, uh, so we have our decentralized JSS is our decentralized authentication. So to authenticate your users to various services, there will always kind of have to be a central user database. But the way we did it is we decentralized it in the sense that you can take it off premise to a highly available solution like Okta. And then from there, you can build it on premise, but it's all mastered by Okta to, to provide authentication that scales regardless of which office you're going to. So here's a, here's a little picture about this. So in, in your enterprise, in your company, in your school, in wherever, wherever you're running all your stuff, who's the identity master? So often, it's Active Directory. Active Directory is often used as single source of truth. You know, who, what's your username? It's whatever my Active Directory username is. So two years ago, uh, I started about two and a half years ago, Eventbrite didn't have a centralized identity directory, and we only had two SaaS apps integrated with Okta. So what that meant is we had a chance to build this whole idea from the ground up. So we actually did pick Active Directory as our identity uh, provider, but we did it uh, in a kind of inverted manner. So Okta, if you're not familiar, is a, is a single sign-on service. We do SAML, and you can do, uh, you can do password uh, pushing through, through Okta and can sign us on to a whole bunch of stuff without just authenticating once to Okta using two-factor there, and then you keep track of, of all access to your software as a service applications from that point. So what we did is we inverted the normal. Normally, people would say, we'll take Active Directory, and that's the master, and we're going to run everything through AD. And that requires either we're going to poke a hole in our firewall to allow that in, or all users all the time have to VPN to be able to actually do anything. So in this case, we flipped it upside down. We said, we're going to make Okta the identity master. And then we're going to funnel everything from Okta down into Active Directory. So Active Directory behaves as a slave to Okta. So what that looks like, if you guys are familiar with Okta, is something like this. This is a configuration of what Okta would look like. We create users directly from Okta into Active Directory instead of the other way around. And we sync our passwords from Okta to Active Directory. So for any user, regardless of what platform they're on, whether they're on Windows, whether they're on Mac, uh, we're mostly Mac, we're about 95% Mac, but if they need to change their their Active Directory password, they always just go to Okta. They don't even realize that what they're messing with is Active Directory. So what, it, what does this mean? It means that now we've made our authentication decentralized. It's not dependent on any particular office because it's reliant on Okta. We have, still have one source of truth. All our users get provision and deprovision directly from Okta. Passwords get pushed from Okta. We can even push groups from Okta to Active Directory, so it makes it seamless. We look in one place, so all the people on our team, if we're trying to figure out, you know, hey, what's wrong with this user's AD account, we just go straight to Okta instead of fiddling around on the back end. And it's, it's distributed, so you have lots of flexible options if you do it this way. Um, by making Active Directory the slave to Okta, you can push portions of your users. Say you had like five domains, you can push you know, the people from this department into one domain, people from this regional office into this other. You could do all sorts of things. You could stand up a brand new domain in a different site and, you know, push, push all the information down. The usernames, the passwords, the groups, all would be the same regardless of where you wanted to, to put, regardless of where, where your office was. You could do it anywhere, and you don't have to fiddle around with ADFS or anything like that. So Okta is a super, super high availability, highly scalable identity management environment. So it's accessible from the cloud. We trust them with the security, just like we trusted the JSS uh, to Jamf Cloud. And then it provides a common vernacular. So when we're talking to our users, they, we just say, hey, it's your Okta password. Hey, how do I get on the VPN? You use your Okta password. How do I get on? How do I enroll in the JSS? You use your Okta password. We don't have to to change our language based on what it is. It's just always their Okta password. And it provides super easy access to applications. So in Okta, it's pretty cool. Since Okta knows the password, you can just basically set up a button. And uh, I have set up a Casper enrollment button. And since it's their, their password is their 
Okta password to enroll in Casper. If they need to enroll a device, I say, hey, go log into Okta, just click this button. And literally, they just click the button, it takes them, it signs them in, and they're already on the enrollment page with their username assigned to their computer, all that kind of stuff. It's pretty cool. So then, to make this kind of take the Starfish example out even further, uh, we used AWS plus uh, read-only domain controllers to kind of build this out. So Active Directory is very good at certain things, and read-only domain controllers are a great example of this. So with a read-only do domain controller, you can have a read-only database, and you can put it out very, very far away from your, your home office uh, so that you're protecting that one, and um, you can cache credentials out there, and replication only goes one way out to there. So this is what it looked like for us to, to starfish this up. So I'm putting all the pieces together, Okta plus Casper plus our read-only domain controller. So there's the Okta logo at the upper left, and what we do is we're pushing that down to our San Francisco and Nashville office uh, read-write domain controllers. So we have, we have two of those. And then from there, we're pushing out to two different uh, AWS read-only domain controllers, one on the West Coast and one on the East Coast. And these are IP restricted, so uh, only certain places can actually see what we're exposing. And essentially, all we did with the read-only domain controllers, we made those, uh, those are basically LDAP-S servers, and they're listening on port 636 to certain IP addresses. And then uh, what, what uh, one of my teammates, Aaron, rigged up this thing called uh, Dyn DNS. So we have our, our LDAP DNS entry. And what it does is it points to uh, these two read-only domain controllers in order. So, uh, you know, AWS does go down, so like we all notice that when AWS East goes down, like a whole bunch of stuff uh, is all of a sudden offline. So one of these is in AWS East, so I think it's number two is in East, number one is in West. So if uh, DynDNS looks at our read-only domain controller and says, hey, you know, it's not responding, AWS must be down, it'll flip the switch and it'll point to the other read-only domain controller. And that's our way of simulating this idea of a starfish. If you cut off an arm, AWS went down, uh, within, I, I forgot what the timeout is, within 30 seconds to a minute, it'll flip over to AWS West and start authenticating against that. So, and Casper, at the end of the day, is pointing to the DynDNS entry, not directly to the the read-only domain controller, so Casper has no idea which one it's authenticating to, it's just, it's just doing it, it's just authenticating. So enrollments for JSS admins to log in, all that kind of stuff is all running through this decentralized piece. And so what you'll notice is the only centralized portion of our architecture here is the San Francisco and Nashville read-write domain controllers. But if you were to cut that part out, so if we got thumped on the head as a spider, organization and our read-write domain controllers were totally offline and unavailable, what you'll notice here is this, is, this whole process is still gonna work. People are still gonna be able to enroll in the JSS, they'll still be able to receive policies, they'll still be able to, to log in, our admins would still be able to, to, to get into Casper and, and manage, manage computers, all that kind of stuff, even if you know, our internet goes down, which, um, which can happen. So, that's Starfish principle number one, decentralized. So the question I pose to you is, how centralized is your IT stuff? If you thump it on the head, it dies. So Starfish IT principle number two is reproducibility. If you take out a unit, the organization is unharmed. So I started continuing this line of thinking, asking the question, what if we made our Mac management and authentication infrastructure super easy to reproduce? And this is a distinct from and addition to uh, traditional backup and disaster recovery. So the way we did it, and you kind of saw a piece of this already happening, was a combination of, of cloud-centric infrastructure instead of office-based or HQ-based infrastructure. Uh, simplicity, documentation, and using the right tools. So uh, someone uh, a while ago introduced me to this idea of thinking about fractals in every single thing that I do. And uh, the idea with this is, regardless of the size of your organization, whatever you're doing, whether it's IT or some other business, uh, think in fractals, infinitely complex patterns that are self-similar across different skills. So applying this to IT environment or the JSS or whatever you're doing, uh, whether you're supporting 30 users or 300 or 3,000, your Mac management environment should be 
uh, easy to scale, and easy to reproduce. So the best picture I have of this is a piece of broccoli. So this is a, a fractal in action. So you'll notice that each part of, each smaller part of the broccoli looks just like the bigger part. So here's an example uh, for, for imaging. So remember I was doing the, the monolithic imaging with iOS 10.2 with iBooks uh, back in 2003. Um, I carried that over, you know, 10.4, 10.5, 10.6. Um, how do you set up your Mac imaging environment so that even if you're supporting only 30 users, which I was doing at a, at a previous job before Eventbrite, um, that you can scale it and reuse your work? So at that, at that company, what I was using was a combination of, of these things. Does anybody use local MCX? Anybody? This is, this is a pretty cool thing. It's kind of like, like Casper, but it's all wrapped up in, in the computer uh, itself. So you would just, uh, with local MCX, you'd be able to do configuration profiles basically by modifying a plist on a, on a computer. So even though I had only 30 users, I was, we weren't ready for Casper. A bushel didn't exist as a, as a product yet. I did local MCX so that, hey, if I ever really needed to change a bunch of uh, preferences at the configuration profile level, I can just push out a new text file uh, via ARD to our devices and they'd still be kind of managed, but not exactly. Um, I did launch daemon, scripts, so I used Package Maker to build packages, Insta DMG, which is the predecessor to Auto DMG to build the image parts. So um, leveraging these principles, I put in similar things like this uh, at Eventbrite before we went to Casper. Um, but because we had all these pieces in place, we had the scripts written, we had the idea of what we want to do, we had our packages, we had um, Auto DMG, base images, all that kind of stuff, we were able to go from the end of our jump start, uh, which was that we onboarded Casper precisely because we had to get that Nashville office up and running. By thinking in fractals and having all these pieces in place even before we went to Casper, within less than 72 hours, we were fully onboarded with Casper Suite, not just, not just the basic we could you know, roll out, I, I think it was 10.8 at the time, we could roll out a 10.8 base image, but we could roll it out exactly the same as we had before with our monolithic imaging uh, right off the bat, and we could ship those things out the next week to Nashville. So um, part of being thinking more like a starfish is to think, think in fractals, because remember, a starfish has no, like each part is self-similar, like it's a, it's a collection of neurons that just keeps on growing up. So um, here's what it looks like in our Casper environment. If you're anything like me, you're always kind of curious what other people's uh, Casper environments look like. And this will probably look uh, pretty similar to yours, I think. Um, this is what, what ours looks like. Uh, we have our Jamf Cloud JSS, so policies, configurations, and scripts, or anything like that. So that's, that's out in the cloud. But we do have on-premise stuff, but they all kind of look the same. So we have all our Casper shares. Uh, we have our master Casper share, and then a bunch of uh, Samba Casper shares at, at our different office locations. For places that we don't have a physical office or a secure place to put anything, then we throw up an AWS cloud distribution point so that we have our Jamf Cloud JSS, which is accessible anywhere across the globe. Doesn't matter if you're in our Melbourne office, which has no IT infrastructure, or you're in San Francisco, where we have a ton of stuff going on. You can always get to uh, one of the packages uh, that you need through self-service. And we have a, a couple net SUS servers uh, that uh, that run software updates and stuff like that, bring it locally. If, if it's not local, it'll go over to Apple. And then between all the, the Casper shares, uh, we have synchronization uh, running in between all of them so that at any, any given point in time, none of the Casper shares are more than a couple hours behind uh, from the other, except maybe London. I think I do that one only twice a day. I'm not updating the packages that often, but. So this is, this is what ours looks like. So, what we're trying to capture here is the same idea with, uh, with making stuff reproducible and flexible. If the Nashville Casper share had a problem, we could just chop it off, stand up a new Linux box, start the sync job again, and we could have a new Casper share over there in as long as it takes to go across the tunnel and, and replicate all those packages. So what we do is we leverage what I just described. We leverage VMs and rsync to spin up new Casper shares pretty rapidly. And it's flexible to accommodate all our locations without opening any walls in our firewall or relying on any connections to Eventbrite HQ in San Francisco. 
And it makes it really easy for us to reproduce a new office. So if we're going to stand up a new office, you know, I just send them some instructions. Uh, a lot of times I'm just pointing to a Jamf Nation article. Hey, here, can you stand up a Casper share and do it like this? And then I'll set up a sync job that'll sync it over. So re reproducible, well, is a reproducible uh, Casper share environment. Here's what the reproducible authentication environment looks like. Um, if your domain dies, uh, this actually happened to me when I was back at that school. We had a Windows NT 4.0 domain controller. Anybody remember, remember that screen? Um, I was scared of that computer. Uh, it, was, it was actually a, a compact desktop, you know, one of the ones that was vertical where you could put the monitor on top. It was running Windows NT 4.0. It was left there by my predecessor. He said, it just works. Just don't touch it. You know, it'll be fine. And so I was, I was totally scared of that computer, so I literally just never touched it. I was like, okay, it's just gonna keep working, it's gonna keep working. And one day it died, and all of a sudden, you know, all the students at the school, they couldn't authenticate to anything. But the thing that saved me was I had a giant Excel spreadsheet. So back then, uh, all the kids, would, I would give them a password. It was a six character random password, XJ2BQ, you know, exclamation point. And I said, you're not allowed to change that password. And they, all the kids, we had like 200 kids at the school, they would actually memorize those passwords. And years later, they would tell me, hey, Jason, you know, my password is XJ2BQ, exclamation point, and they would, they would just remember it. But the nice thing about that was I had it all in a giant Excel spreadsheet. So then I used a bunch of Active Directory scripts um, to stand up a Windows 2000 domain controller and push down all the users' information, passwords, all back into a new domain controller. So it was pretty stressful, but it wasn't as bad as it could have been. You can do that with Okta. I described that earlier with the funnel. If you flip it upside down, you say, hey, you know, Okta's got all our cloud stuff. We're going to rely on them to take care of authentication, <coughs> password policies, our passwords, um, all that kind of stuff, it's just going to push down from Okta to Active Directory. It's not as stressful of a situation if your domain controller uh, decide your compact sitting on a shelf in a closet uh, decides to poop out, and uh, you can just spin up a new one. So how reproducible is your, is your environment if part of it dies? If you take out a unit, the organization is unharmed. That's a spider organization. Starfish principle number three is flexibility. The organization is flexible. That's a cute little starfish. So the end result of this is flexibility. Um, and this applies to both your users and your IT staff. So there's a, a growing trend, and a lot of the sessions uh, at JNAC have been talking about this idea of user-centric IT. And that's empowering your users to work uh, regardless of where they are, regardless of what device they're using, uh, regardless of Windows, Mac, whatever. Um, empower them to be able to work the way they want to work, whether it's on their device, on a, a company-managed device, or a school-managed device. So we have users distributed across the globe. And uh, I'm sure all of, a lot of you have deal, are dealing with this in varying degrees. And this means that the traditional model of centralized IT, the firewall, the, the perimeter, is, it, it just doesn't work anymore. So what would it look like for us to deliver IT services in a starfishy kind of way that users are accustomed to. They pull out their phone, they pull out their Mac, and w whatever they want to do, they can, they can just do it, and while still preserving enterprise integrity and security. So again, we're doing this with Casper Suite and Okta. And i um, just going to throw up a couple examples of what we're doing. So uh, this is how we manage uh, software updates. I'm, I'm excited, just like many of you, about uh, what Jamf's going to do with patch management. But for now, we're doing uh, NetSUS we have internal ones, and then otherwise, if they're, if they're off network, then we're going to set them to the Apple one, and then we run a script that, that prompts them for uh, whether or not they want to install their software updates. Um, and then at the same time, that script is on the back end of self-service, which they just come over here, and they click on a button, check for updates, and it's running that, and it's, uh, we're approving which ones are going to be let through. They click check for updates, it pops up a dialog box saying, hey, here's the updates that you're going to install. Uh, making it flexible for patch management for your IT staff. So if you guys remember, there was the, the shell shock uh, vulnerability that came out. I forget when that was, maybe six months ago or something like that. And the particularly scary thing was it said a remote attacker may be able to execute arbitrary commands on your computer. That sounds pretty scary. So I bet a lot of you did something like this, and this is where um, 
it was really helpful that we had our, our JSS fully accessible to the outside internet sitting out there. Regardless of where our users were, we were able to go through this, this process. So create an extension attribute to collect their bash version, create a smart group saying, and this is the Mavericks example, if it's 10.95 and the bash version is not whatever it was supposed to be, 3.2.5.3, then force install on the next check-in. So we were able to do that uh, with patch management. So that's just a couple examples. So I'm going to end with a, a couple pictures, so Starfish IT putting it all together. So uh, one of the pain points that we were dealing with was uh, VPN. So users had to, had to install an app uh, on their computer, open VPN, they had to log in, and they had to remember what their Okta username and password is. They had to type it in. They had to do two-factor authentication and get it all back in. So we've uh, been able recently to kind of hook it all up and make it all play really nicely and um, attach another security part of it using Casper to kind of keep it all nice and secure and make sure VPN's only running on the devices that we want. So this is what it kind of looks like. So we got the Mac end user, uh, and that's a Casper managed computer. Um, they attempt to log into VPN. And now the way they do it, they don't have to click on the open VPN thing anymore. They actually literally just go to Okta, and since VPN is leveraging LDAP, which is exposed through the read-only domain controller, they just click on a button that says Open VPN. And they can pick, um, we, we set it up the same way. We have three VPN servers, uh, AWS West, East, you know, uh, and South America. They can just click on the one that's most geographically appropriate, and it'll automatically log them in, walk them through the two-factor authentication process. And then on the Casper side, we're doing a policy check. We say, there are certain things that we want to be running on there. Is firewall on? Is firewall 2 on? Is AV running? If yes, sure, let's let them run OpenVPN and get logged into the VPN. If the answer is no, then we disallow VPN. And that's all the same thing. It's running independently of whether our HQ is up or not. It's just, it's just all out there in the cloud, and it's all we feel you know, pretty comfortable about that. So this is what it looks like on the back end. Uh, when we provision somebody for VPN, the thing we do is we add them to a group in Okta. Remember, we're managing all of Active Directory completely through Okta, so all through the cloud. Uh, through AD group push, it's an Okta feature. It pushes it down to the read-write domain controller. And then through standard read-only domain controller replication, it pushes it over to AWS. Uh, and this is just one box, but remember, how we had it before is actually two boxes through dynamic DNS. And then we have our multiple uh, VPN servers, and they all talk to AWS through LDAPS. And there's your Mac managed by Casper. And all they see from the user perspective, remember, this is all on the back end. And it, to the end user, it doesn't really matter. What they really care about is, is this going to be easy, and I don't need to worry about, you know, all the security stuff, it's all, we're all taking care of that all through Okta, uh, all through Casper. And literally, all they do is they just click, click a button. They say, users log into VPN. And then based on that, the previous slide, if all the security checks are there, let them through. If not, let's disallow it and pop up a message. Oh, Patrick, requisite. All right, so starfish or spider? They both don't seem that scary to me in this picture, but I'm still more scared by spiders. So I'm going to leave. I'm going to end there. I'm going to ask a few questions. And just kind of like in, in, in all honesty, we're still a work in progress. We're still figuring this out. Uh, we're still fig asking these questions of ourselves as well. So um, just to put it out there back to you, what parts of your IT infrastructure are built like a spider? And what parts of them are built like a starfish? And what would happen to your Mac management systems or your authentication if your HQ went down? And uh, what's one thing that you could implement after JNAC to enable your organization to be more decentralized, more reproducible, and more flexible? That's it. And I'll open it up to some questions. So just a reminder, I'm not going to be running around with the microphone, so please do speak up with your question. We'll repeat it and then answer. Thank you. Yeah. Has the damn cloud ever gone down for you? No. It, it, 
it has not. We did have, we did have a, a situation where um, it was unavailable for a few hours, but mainly it was because we were running JDSs. And uh, if you guys were familiar with the, the JDS, the way it was replicating it, it replicates entire packages back to the JSS and then back down. Uh, and so for us, basically, it was kind of funny because we had our JDS on site and it was replicating up to the cloud and then coming back down to the other JDS that so was on site. And it was causing some, some Tomcat issues. So that's why we switched to Samba shares. And then we just uh, sync them independently. But other than that, it's, yeah, fully running all the time. We haven't had any issues. Yeah. So I really love the idea of uh, Okta being the master to um, AD. Uh, I think we're actually looking at implementing something very similar. But um, what do you anticipate would be the impact if Okta were to not be available, if it were to go down? OK, so the question was, um, uh, what, what would we have to do if Okta went down, basically? Like, we'd kind of be in trouble. Uh, Honestly, because so for the authentication piece with uh, Active Directory and the read-only domain controllers, we'd actually be fine. Basically, what would happen is nobody would be able to update their passwords anymore. Uh, but authentication would still be fine because we have another script that runs and replicates all the passwords um, to, to read-only domain controllers so that if we had a problem there, at least for the time being, people would still be able to authenticate. Um, but if Okta went down, since we're highly dependent on SAML for a lot of things, that would also mean we wouldn't be able to get into any of our other apps as well. So that's, that's just kind of a risk we have to take, and we're trusting that, that they'll do their best job to keep it up. So the question was uh, that uh, there, you're thinking about uh, a similar situation, trying to get your remote users access to your distribution points, and how did you get uh, syncing working without uh, opening up holes in the firewall? So we have it uh, set up for, so we use cloud distribution point, which the JSS makes really easy to kind of, kind of get up and running. Uh, but we don't, use, we don't use Casper admin to sync it, sync the, the files up to the AWS cloud distribution point. Um, it, it's hosted on S3, and then we just have a connection directly to that S3 bucket from, from our office uh, where the, the master Casper share is. And then we use a tool called S3 Sync, which is a, a command line tool. We run it on a Linux box, and it pushes up from our master Casper share to the cloud distribution point. And then the way the JSS the way Casper Suite sets it up is it puts out a CloudFront uh, distribution method so that all our remote users, they basically just pull packages straight from, straight from Amazon and not from us. Does that, does that answer the question? Or is that? Well, I'm just curious how you didn't open up your firewall in the office so it could speak to Amazon. Oh, um, we, have a, we have a VPN tunnel in between. Any other questions? Yeah. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Okta, they're able to go onto the website and actually reset their password to just get it set up. Do they also offer a tool for, let's say, I forgot my password? Just out of curiosity. Does Okta offer that? Yes. Yes, yes they do. And they, it, it can send like an SMS or something like that to verify as long as they had entered their phone number before. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was, did I get any pushback from budgetary perspective on hosting the JSS with Jamf Cloud instead of hosting it on site? Uh, so our kind of approach and our philosophy is very 
very cloud uh, friendly. So our whole office is very open to putting a ton of stuff in the cloud. So there is an additional cost to host your JSS with Jamf Cloud, but I think it's actually really reasonable for what it is. And if you weigh it against the cost of, um, even if we stood it up our, ourselves in Amazon uh, and, or had physical hardware on site, you know, there would be some costs associated with that as well. And then the trade-off is uh, the maintenance aspect. So I'm the primary person that, that takes care of you know, Casper stuff on our team. And I'm also working on Okta stuff and some of the Active Directory stuff and some other things all at the same time. So um, I don't have the expertise nor the, the time resources to be able to figure out, oh, shoot, the JSS is kind of, the, the SQL database is having some problems. Like, I don't know. I don't have the expertise on how to do that. So the trade-off is, um, from budgetary perspective, we can pitch it to say, hey, it frees my time up to do some of these other things, and we allow Jamf Cloud, um, you know, those guys are awesome uh, to, to be able to handle that kind of stuff for us. Right, so the question was, I talked a lot about our making our infrastructure more like a starfish, but what about making our, our personnel more, more starfishy? And the answer is we're working on it. So our, one thing that's cool about our Bright Tech team is, is we're relatively flat in terms of the, the things that we work on. So I do everything from uh, clear paper jams uh, to uh, you know, people's you know, charger broke or you know resetting a local password or I, I do tons of tons of desktop support stuff like the AV thing won't turn on um, to doing the the server architecture and working on Casper so that's a pretty awesome thing about our team like I, I love that uh, any other any other people on my team I can rely on them be like hey you know we all need to kind of pitch in can we can we work together on this so literally everybody kind of does a little bit of everything. That said, at the end of the day, we all kind of have things that we kind of own a little bit more, and Casper is one of them for me. But we're try I'm trying to um, kind of loop people in a little bit more, and also we're, we're doing a big push to document like crazy, and uh, we're pumping a whole bunch of stuff into our, our internal database, and also it, it populates our help desk database also. So any help articles that might be Casper-related or Okta-related, if a user goes to our help site and types in Okta, like some stuff will pop up. So we're working on it. We're not quite there yet. We're kind of work in progress. Any other questions? All right. So I have a whole bunch of Eventbrite stuff that my recruiting team gave me, like pens and stickers, and I don't want to carry it home. So you guys are welcome to come up and, and take, take what you want. You can ask me other questions. I'd love to, to chat more and figure stuff out. So.